what would you change in your life? What if you could unleash the miraculous in your everyday life? Experience freedom, live in peace, change the world, become spirit contemporary. Join Leon Fontaine, world-renowned conference speaker, senior pastor of Canada's fastest growing church and CEO of Canada's only Christian TV station. Today on The Spirit Contemporary Life. The teaching of the Bible is one that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that we belong to that kingdom. In John 10.10, 10, it says that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So why is there such a disconnect between this biblical promise and how most Christians live today? Why have so many believers become spiritually weak and ineffective at sharing Jesus' message of love? The Spirit Contemporary Life is the answer. It's being led by Holy Spirit, but in a contemporary way. It's being Jesus and demonstrating His love in ways people can understand and appreciate. Spirit Contemporary is unique for everyone. It never compromises the truth, and it never makes others feel uncomfortable. It's freeing yourself from religious constraints and walking freely in God's amazing grace for His purpose. The Spirit Contemporary Life is absolutely crucial if the global church and her people are going to change the world. And now, from Winnipeg, Canada, Pastor Leon Fontaine. There's an incredible verse about Christmas in Isaiah chapter 9 that I want to read you, and I'm going to unpack it a little bit and teach from it because it is so mind-blowing, and it is so not what Christianity is. We've missed it somehow. And so I want to use this portion of Scripture to maybe help you, help us, Kind of get back on course as to why Christmas is so important and this Jesus that Christians around the world celebrate and serve. It just brings out something I think we need to look at. So here we go. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. I love Christmas. For those of you who've been around, I mean, from our house to uh, churches to where, I just, I love Christmas. I love all the Christmas stories, fables, Someone nailed me one time and said, what's well, all about Jesus? What's with Santa the Grinch and everything else? And so I, I waxed eloquent. And I said, well, even Jesus made up stories. He did? I said, yeah, they're called parables. And the purpose of a parable was to tell a story that wasn't, didn't happen. It's a made-up story to make a point. I said, so what's your big issue? With all these fairy tales and stuff, most societies use fairy tales to teach points. Don't lie. Uh, good will always win. And so I said, as long as you realize Jesus is the reason for the season, I have no problem with all the rest of the stuff. Relax. Stop being so religious and judgmental. We're celebrating Jesus, but we can have all the other fun and not be someone that people see coming to work and go, oh, don't talk to this guy. But Jesus, a baby, a lot of people don't get past the baby. Now, I love babies. Anyone that hangs around me, I mean, Sal and I had five kids. She'd have had more, and uh, maybe we should have, I don't know. 
And now we got grandbaby. And there's something about this baby when you pick him up with a little toothless smile, these little chubby cheeks, and you get to kiss him on both cheeks. And then they hit about five or six months where they actually cuddle you and they hang on to you. And I mean, I could go, I love babies. But that's as far as some people see Jesus, is this cute baby. And they'll read this verse, the government will rest on his show. How many times have you heard that verse read? It's read all the time, everywhere, the Christmas story. And I love it. I love the fact that Jesus is a gift to us. But I want to show you something here that, that actually has really inspired me even more this season as I was meditating on this portion of Scripture. It's talking about a child being born. And it says the government will rest on his shoulders. Now, the word government isn't the one government that you and I think of, because here in Canada, when we think government, we think democracy. Who are we going to vote for? Liberals, PC, NDP. But the word government here in the original means his rule and his dominion. It says, so the rule and the dominion is going to rest on Jesus' shoulders. What rule? What dominion? When Jesus came... A new kingdom was established. This kingdom is called the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. They asked Jesus, where is this kingdom? He says, it's not a kingdom you can see with your physical eyes. He says, it's a kingdom from within. Even when Jesus walked the planet as he grew up there in Israel, occupied by an enemy country, Rome was in charge. Yet it couldn't stop the gospel. China can't stop Jesus. North Korea can't stop the kingdom of God. It's alive and well in Russia. It's alive and well in China. It's alive. There was days they used to kill you for being a Christian in some of these countries. And all it did was make the church grow greater, grow stronger. The kingdom of God can't be stopped. And on of this kingdom, there will be no end. This kingdom is going to increase. It's going to increase. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get more powerful. In fact, the Bible says that we will disciple nations. Some Christians, or actually a lot of Christians as I travel and get kind of a more a greater worldview of Christians' ideology, their worldview. I'm surprised that the majority of people that I speak with, their worldview of Christianity is that we're kind of the resistance. You know, when, when Nazi was occupying France, there was the French resistance. And they would kind of, you know, blow up little convoys and they'd attack and you, maybe you've seen movies and, and then they'd disappear into the bush and they'd hide in the alleys and they'd try to plague this great big evil group. And sometimes people see the church like that. That the world is impossible to stop. It's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get more evil. And they use a few verses out of context to paint that picture. And so we, the church, we're the David of this great big church. No, no, get it right. The Bible says that upon this kingdom, this rule and reign of Jesus, it says there will be no end to the increase. No end. Well, but, 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 but I heard a, my favorite preacher on TV say that it's going to wax worse and worse. Oh, some people will. It says it's going to be a great falling away. It's not talking about now. This is talking about the time when Jesus left and what was taking place in the time frame that's already happened. The teaching of the Bible is one that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and that we belong to that kingdom. You know, all of us are trying to find our heritage. You can go get a blood test now. One of my daughters went and got a blood test and found out that how much native is in her, how much First Nations, how much of this, and, you know, we're, we're probably Heinz 157. <laughs> and you start looking at this, and you think you're finding your roots. You think you're finding who you are. Well, how do you find out who you are in 40 different countries that you're from? Oh, I know you're a purebred, but I'm a mutt. The kingdom that gives me my identity is not Canada. Oh, I'm Canadian, but I'm Havinian first. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And, amen. 
And although I'm in a democracy here, I love democracies in the physical world, Jesus is not, a, we don't vote on the decisions Jesus makes. He is the king of kings. And the Western world knows nothing about kingdoms. And we've got to understand. Now, what kind of a ruler, what kind of a king is he? Well, it says his name will be called Wonderful. He's not called a tyrant. His name will be called Counselor. Why would they put the word Counselor in there? Because when you've got a tyrant who rules people, he rules them with a fist of iron, and he says, move, you move. He doesn't tell you why. But here, the king of kings will counsel you in your own heart about your identity, your call, your future, your giftings, discovering where you should be. It's not this socialistic uh, thing where you're going to pick potatoes and you're going to make vodka and, and that's, that's it. No, no, no. This is something that the king will counsel with you. His presence will heal you. He'll touch you. It says he's the mighty God. He's the eternal father, the prince of control. No, he's the prince of peace. Upon his shoulders rests the government upon his shoulders rests all rule and dominion and that's who we serve i serve jesus before i serve canada i serve jesus before i serve popular opinion i serve jesus and if i have to offend at times i won't back down from jesus Others, by the thousands, have given their lives. All we need to worry about is a little embarrassment. This Jesus, the government rests on his shoulders. And oh, his rule, his dominion is wonderful, peaceful. But at the same time, it's not like, it's not like don't mistake God's kindness for his weakness. One of our greatest problems in some businesses and countries is you think to be powerful, you got to be mean. To be powerful, you got to dictate. To be powerful, take out anybody that messes with you. But Jesus is the servant king. He said he came to serve mankind. But upon his shoulders rests the government, the rule of this kingdom. When you give your life to Jesus... Whether you are American, Canadian, uh, you know, French, or I don't care, it doesn't really matter. You enter the most important citizenship of all, the family of God. And Jesus, the one we celebrate at Christmas, he's incredible. He's amazing. And if your worldview of the world is that the world is so powerful and Satan's going to become more powerful, then we got antichrists and beasts and harlots. And, and somebody took the book of Revelation and misunderstood it so bad that it made the devil big and God little. It made the world amazing and the church pathetic. It made the world, the, no, the church of Jesus Christ is the only reason this planet has not imploded or exploded. We are the reason. And if ever this church is gone, this world is finished. The only hope is that Jesus is building his church. Jesus must be such an ineffective builder that the church he's building is pathetic and unable to touch the world. It must be that Jesus is such a wimpy leader and king, and although the government and the rule and reign rests on his shoulders, but to be a part of the church is to be kind of gosh golly gee where are we getting these ideas the church of jesus christ is the only reason that countries are even making it because even if it's an evil leader inside that country it's kind of like you know uh, when abraham was interceding for sodom and gomorrah and god was talking to him evil evil cities he said but, but lord if there's but 20 would you spare it he said, i'll spare it Abraham for 20. But, 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 but the Lord, don't think I'm too forward, but, but uh, if I can find 10, would you spare it for 10? God said, I'd spare it for 10. I think Abraham made a mistake and should have went for four, three. God is so good. God is so amazing. We need to understand 
that this Christmas, as we celebrate Jesus, it's not a one-time happening that we all go, Jesus, little cute baby with chubby cheeks and no teeth, and he's smiling, and, and he's laying with these three wise men and the camels, and there's a star above him. I, I, I do all that. We've even got all that set up in our... It's, it's beautiful. But I have a deeper understanding, a deeper wow on the inside of me that goes... 2,000 years ago was the start of a kingdom that the greatest champions on this planet join. Men and women, warrior princesses, men that, who know they are in Christ, standing for something. And the only thing that will keep your family, your kids, and your grandkids strong will be the freedom of religion, the ability to bring Jesus to a world that is hungry. Only Jesus can meet this deepest need that every one of us thinks we get it from our career, our spouse, sex, drugs whatever it is it's this Jesus it says at the very last part of, of verse 7 as it talks about his kingdom will always increase I want you to notice that it's never gonna decrease it only increases it started with 120 2,000 years ago and today it's passed a billion to two billion people that profess Jesus as their Lord as their Savior the last line says from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Anytime you see a name of God, you need to examine it. The word, the Lord of hosts. The word hosts means hosts of armies. Excuse me? Hosts of armies. What armies? The angelic hosts. Jesus himself said when they were going to kill him, he says, you don't take my life, I give it. <laughs> You're going to kill God? I don't think so. I lay down my life for the human race that I love. And I can call 10,000 angels, legions of angels, and destroy the world. This Jesus is now King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not some little baby with no power and no might. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Revelations chapter 1 and 2 shows us what he looks like now. And he's not no longer this cute little baby in a manger in swaddling clothes. He is, is dressed in armor with eyes like fire, hair. I mean, this incredible figure that made John fall on his face because of the power that radiated off of Jesus and what he looks like now. It says he's the Lord of of angelic armies the Lord of hosts and that's what's going to accomplish this Jesus as he grew up in his 30s he died gave his life died on the cross for you and I but in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16 he's he's asking his disciples 12 of his closest friends who am I who do people say that I am they got it wrong. The 11 disciples didn't know, and they were quoting other people, but Simon Peter answered. And he said, you, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I want you to know that for Christians to stay strong, they need a revelation of who Jesus is. You can't just come and try to get fire insurance. Okay, where do I got a sign to, to miss hell, Leon? Just like, well, okay, I, I just, I'm just going to become a Christian. It's actually not like that. It's a relationship. It's a believing. And as you choose Christ, Holy Spirit reveals him to you. And it says here, Blessed are you, Simon Bar, Jonah, because flesh and blood, this was not explained to you by a flesh and blood teacher, but my Father who is in heaven. And I will also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Stop right there. Some people think that Peter was the one we're building the church on. And so we got St. Peter's everywhere, in every country. And most cities have a St. Peter's, which is cool. I don't care what they call it. But that's not what he's saying. We're not building the church on a man, Peter. We're building a church on the revelation that Peter got, which was that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is our Lord. And said, that's what we build our church on. And then he says, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So to all of you end times prognosticators who, who love to sell books and get on TV, it says that it's never going to overpower the church. That the church of Jesus Christ, which is his name of his kingdom, is always going to be increasing, never decreasing, increasing. And, it says, and, then, and then it says, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth has been bound in heaven. 
Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. I don't have much more time, but I want to plant a thought in your mind. How can I say it in a minute and 27 seconds? One of the greatest reasons why the smartest people, no, not the smartest, why many of the smart people on the planet who just think nonstop about Christianity don't accept Christianity isn't because it doesn't bear out. I've interviewed scientists and some of the most brilliant minds on the planet who are passionately in love with Jesus. But the one governing thought that many struggle with is this Christian doctrine that says God is in control. And God is love. Take those two thoughts and try to put them together. How many women are being raped today? How many children are being killed, molested? How many babies are starving of hunger? Who's being murdered on this planet right now as we speak? And if you've got any kind of a brain in your head, you kind of go, how do those two thoughts go together? God's a God of love, and God has the whole world in his hands. I was debating with a group of doctorates and seminaries this very topic one day after a television program, and they were trying to say stuff like, well, you know, God has a reason for everything. I said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And they got, their eyes got this big. I said, what do you tell that little three-year-old baby dying of brain cancer, screaming in pain, that oh, there's a reason behind it? See, people who think this through choose not to accept Christ because of the church's stance, which is not even in the Bible. He's got the whole world in his hands. But that's not even a verse in the Bible. It's a song. Corinthians 4.4 4 says, Satan is the God of this world. But now when you give your life to Christ and you come into the kingdom of his dear son, you can by faith give your life to him and give him control and speak to mountains. It literally says here that we must believe. Christianity was never called Christianity. You know what it was called? It was called the way. And it was the way of believers. You had to believe that Jesus was Lord. You had to believe that Jesus died. You had to personally believe that he would be involved in your personal life. You had to begin to believe that he had given you authority, you power to pray. And, and prayer is not a begging, pleading prayer, but know how to change the things that are going on on this planet. In Timothy, it teaches us that, first of all, pray for kings and leaders, those who are in authority. Why? Because when you learn how to pray, because prayer is not just talking to God. That's one kind of prayer. The kind of prayer that takes authority over the dominions of darkness, that takes authority over disease, over, over early death, all is taught in the Bible that it has a lot to do with what you believe. How do you see Jesus? How do you see yourself? And if we see God as He's got the whole world in his hands, and he's a God of love. You are walking right into the trap of where so many have tried to share their faith. God has given you so much free will that you can choose whatever you want. Even by default, if you don't choose him and learn the authority and the power that is in the name of Jesus, and in prayer as we pray, you'll miss this whole thing about Jesus. The kingdom of God will always be increasing. Our king is Jesus, and he is wonderful. He is filled with peace. He is almighty. He is the authority in our world. And I want to challenge you this Christmas, instead of just listening to religious beliefs instead of just in grabbing onto things you've been taught by somebody that you when you start to think about it go doesn't even make sense go back to god's word and believe that the presence of god will give you a revelation of who jesus truly is I want to take a moment and pray with you. When it comes to the spirit contemporary life, it is something that needs to be focused on every day of your life. You see, to be spiritually alive 
is something the Word talks about all the time. In fact, when it talks about being Spirit-filled in Ephesians 5, it says, be being Spirit-filled, meaning you must maintain a Spirit-filled life. It's crucial. How do you do that? By praying in the Spirit, spending time with Jesus, by getting into God's Word. These are crucial to keeping yourself up, aglow, one of the versions say. And then to be contemporary is use your head. Make sure that everywhere you are, that there is a wisdom as how you deal with people. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray your presence would guide them, lead them. I pray that they would keep themselves filled with your presence, that they would look for opportunities to share Jesus. And I pray that, Father, all around them, miracles would begin to take place in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. It's no accident that you watch today's show. You are special and you have a destiny to fulfill. Our media ministry reaches some of the darkest corners of the world, and your support is what makes this possible week after week. You are vital. You can change a life. Act today.